feel it working. Every month we interview 10,000 customers. For a start, form boxes that don't work. Over the last few years, we've made sure that at any one time, more than 9 out of 10 of them do work. You didn't mend it when you said you would. Actually, we get to nearly 90% of line faults within one working day. And if we don't restore your service by the end of the next working day, you can claim a month's line rental for every extra day you wait. It's the charges on the phone bill I can't figure out. We've been working on that, and we can now offer three out of four customers the choice of itemised bills. We've been listening to you and turning the negatives into positives. We're now able to make the BT commitment a complete set of service standards for you, the customer. Here it is. I'd like you to read it. The BT Commitment, a full set of service standards addressing your concerns. For your copy, call us free on 0800 800 885. This light Philadelphia you bought is so delicious. Thank you. I can't stop eating it. Yes, I'm rather partial to it myself. Oh, I'm afraid you want some too. Oh, um, yes, yes, it's definitely the six amp fuse shorting through the alternator. Unless, of course, we've got to judge... Oh, did Dad remember to join the AA this year? No, but I know a woman who did. Now you can join the AA from the comfort of your own home. Just ring 0800 91 95 95. The AA. We're all you need to know. Well, you know what I've always thought would be a high spot in my life? To have a marquee on the lawn. Hester plans a party to remember tomorrow at 8.30. Including two contenders from Hampshire, The Krypton Factor with Gordon Burns in 30 minutes. First, a new series of the TVS programme, Country Ways. We begin with the best-known section of Dorset coastline, the Chesil Beach, in December. Great Chesil Bank sweeps like a pebbled highway for more than 10 miles along the Dorset coast, from Portland, past Abbotsbury and on to Burton Bradstock. It's a unique creation of nature and a symbol of the awesome power of the sea, which has piled it up over the centuries. At the eastern end, the Great Wall is 60 feet high and 200 yards wide at its base, yet the waves have often smashed over this barrier and flooded and ruined the houses behind it. During a memorable storm in 1824, the water is described as pouring over the bank at Fleet as fast as a galloping horse and at a depth of 30 feet. Behind the Chesil shelters some of the best of Dorset, the Bride Valley with its green downs, thatched villages and old-fashioned farming. It's the countryside of old England and still breeds some of the great characters whom Thomas Hardy described with such clarity and pride. Men have been fishing off the Chesil Beach back into the mists of time. Crossing the fleet, the stretch of water between the bank and the mainland, they've cast their nets into the English Channel and been well rewarded. Today, Maurice Connolly from Langton Herring carries on the tradition and knows the Chesil and its moods 
as well as anyone along this dangerous coast. The fish are not as plentiful as once they were, but the challenge is the same as it always has been. Hunting is easier than rowing. Uh, it's a tradition that's been carried out on the fleet for hundreds of years. I mean, all the boats had quants and poked grass. You can sort of control yourself better on the mud flats and such like that. You're in very shallow water all the time, especially on the low tides. I started fishing when I was 10, about, well, that must be 40 odd years ago now. Um, I came over with the same crew that was fishing for mackerel in those days, started in the summer months. Uh, we used to go over in the evenings after tea, after the men had finished work. A lot of the men in those days worked at the local brickyard at Chickerel, and they used to ride up on bikes. People have been doing certainly mackerel fishing off of the beach for generations, or certainly back 10th, 11th century. Records date back that far, proving it. Oh yes, it's certainly a hard life over here. It can be very cold. I mean, I have known the pebbles to be frozen solid, so they're like concrete, and then they're very dangerous because they're slippery. You can never predict ahead what the weather's going to be. I mean, you come over one evening and shoot it off thinking it's going to be nice, and uh, next morning it's... That is why we leave the rope ashore, so that we can always pull it ashore if conditions deteriorate. biggest fish was a basking shark once in February. Uh, cold, bitter day, and came over and started to haul the trammel ashore by hand. We didn't have the winch in those days. And kept saying, net's coming hard today, what have we got in here? And all of a sudden, this huge shark lurked on the surface. And uh, we pulled it in, untangled it, and it was still alive, so we let it go. The basking shark was some 17, 18 foot long. So it's quite docile and harmless. In December, uh, it, it a lot depends on the weather, of course. Uh, very rarely, you can get a float. But in between the storms, often you can get two or three nice fish. And of course, when you get a day like today, when you catch nothing. But that's fishing, isn't it? During the summer months, Donald Peach takes visitors from Abbotsbury to the nearby Swannery in his pony and trap. In December, there's less temptation to use this form of transport, but the views across the Chesil Bank are still magnificent, and the surrounding scenery as enticing as ever. Driving a horse is, is a wonderful pleasure. You've really got to do it to appreciate it, you know. You're trotting along the road, you can hear his hoofs and the carts just swinging a little bit. The sun shining, sees over the other side. Wonderful job, yes. It's a wonderful uh, experience, really, to be able to, to do this. I'm very fortunate, yeah. We're as good as the Duke of Edinburgh, you see, once we we're up in that cart. <laughs> Donald was apprenticed to a blacksmith when he left school. In his forge at Langton Herring, where he's worked as a coast guard for much of his life, he still makes carts for Shetland ponies to pull, old-fashioned shepherd's crooks, and men's implements and ironwork for the villagers. I fished for about 30 years for mackerel, same fished off the Chisel Beach for mackerel, 
Yes, that was a very interesting life. Hard life at times. Uh, Mid-April till uh, mid-September. So we were home when the cold winds blew. Yes. And when did blacksmithing come into this? Well, uh, we done the two, I suppose you could say. I left school at 14 and got a job here. And um, the war was on at that time, of course. Fish were in great demand. And we used to fish four o'clock in the morning, get home half past seven, work eight o'clock, knock off again half past five, and back over on the Chisel Beach again till midnight. Used to pray for the wind to blow sometimes so we could get some rest. This particular forge had a good reputation for producing shepherd's crooks. They went all over Dorset, all by hand and eye, yes, there's no measurement. We start with a solid piece of steel and work out the haft or the part that holds the handle. And then as you see me working, draw out the rest of it to get it down to about three eighths and then to a, finally to a point to make the end cook. Yes, it's um, never less than two and a half hours. High above Burton Bradstock, at the western end of the Chesil Beach, the Knightsmith family lives in old-fashioned splendour at Norburton Hall. Their home has become a social mecca for the village and for the Bride Valley. <laughs> On a December morning, the British Legion meets for a friendly Skittles match under the supervision of Felicity Knightsmith in what was once the old stables. I was a keen tennis player and any sporty game I liked. And you can learn and improve. But Skittles is just the mood you're in. And you can't get anything, except the Ed experts say they can, but I don't know, they've gone through. When well, they say they're good and they've gone through with a naught. It's not a game that you can really practice on. It's a lot of luck about it. This was a very old barn without a roof, and our scout leader, who is a builder, had to, had to mine the alley, which he was had built for once a year for the outdoor fete in alley, um, Oscarswell. And then, otherwise, it had to be stored away. So we said, well, look, if you're going to put it down, then we'll use it, and we'll buy it from you. That cost us £100. Then he had the job of putting the roof on, then we had to get the electricians in, and so it was over a thousand pounds. But he's given us hours and hours of pleasure. Yes, yes, yes. There has to be eight in the team, and we play five lanes. So far this year, we stay, hopefully, are in this next round, because we have won all of our, but one of our ten matches. You're on, Nick. Get the cheese biscuits with the cheese. We had a boy up the other day to play, take the place of Nick, to be a sticker up. He was only in the village. He said, I'd like to come again. You know, none of you are the same as when we see you in the village. <laughs> That shows what we were like up here. Yeah, right on. How many games? Oh. I don't know really why any of us go away for holidays when you've got Abbotsbury along the coast and things like that. I don't know really why. Weather's wonderful. The only thing now, as we're getting a little bit older, we're a bit out of the village. So if we move, we'll find a suitable house down in the village. We don't want to leave Burton. After school on the same afternoon, the village children come up to Norburton Hall for a Christmas Punch and Judy show, presented by Sylvia Knightsmith. This party performance has become an annual fixture in Burton Bradstock. Dear little 
little baby over there. The puppet survived in the family about uh, 64 and a half years ago when Nick was only a little fella of about a year old and Daddy went to Hamley's and bought a Punch and Judy show to entertain us because he'd had one when he was a very small boy. Well then, I don't remember it being used at all until I was quite grown up and Daddy dug it out for the brownies. And from then it was used a few times for the brownies and then put away again in the attic. And what made me get it out after Daddy'd passed away, that was about 17 years ago, I don't remember. But since then, I have played with it quite a lot. There you are. Oh, just a wicky, wicky, wicky little bit. Be careful. You be good this time, Mr. Punch. I don't want to be good. You've got to be good today. Give it to me, no, Mr. Punch. Give me the baby, the Mr. Punch, Mr. Punch. Oh, poor baby. First of all, we entertained the brownies by my fox terrier. used to do a circus. And then, alas, we have not the fox terrier. He used to climb ladders and wear a ballet frock and things like that. And I think that's really why we dug it out again, when we hadn't got funny anymore. Well, I'm going to make a pudding. That's flour, Mr. Punch. Now, be careful. Oh, is that flour? Yeah. Leave it alone. Now, what else do I want for the pudding? Now, butter and sugar. Have you got the flour? Ah, oh, you've got the flour! Oh, Mr. Punch! Oh, oh, if you have a, f a funny mind that has refused to grow up and likes playing about with children, it's not a bit difficult. <laughs> It's very simple because I, I could do a much more sophisticated affair, but they seem to get away with the very simple one. Oh, I love children in any circumstance. Any circumstance, I like children. I'm a, a wasted mother. The Chesil has been famous for centuries for its smuggling and for its shipwrecks. Boats of all shapes and sizes have trawled, traded and travelled along its length. Ron Berry from Chickerall is in a proud and long line of boat builders in the area. He has been making them from wood for the last 44 years and, at his peak, used to turn out with his team five clinker-built boats a week. All right, come on, let's run this to the salt. I'm repairing boats now, more, more so than i ever done before me. I wouldn't, years ago, I wouldn't touch a repair job. I just built all new, you see. But uh, now, I'm, you do anything these days, like, you know. Off the Chesil Bank here, I mean, it's, it's terrible at times, absolutely wicked. I've seen it, seas come over the top and over the little sea, you know. So they've got to be very, very strong. Oh, they've got, oh yes, they are strong. What's yeah. timber, then? Mostly elm planking and oak ribs, you see. So what's going to happen when we run out of elm plank? Well, we're struggling now for elm. You can't get elm now. There's none in England. And the elm won't get now is coming from Scotland, and that's the last. When that's gone, you won't get no more elm. That's the end of it. So the sort of boat you're patching today, that's going to be more and more difficult? It is, yes, yeah. I've got a log now. I'm going to try and hold on to that one as long as I possibly can, you know. I don't see too many people. All I do is build boats myself. I don't, uh, I don't go... All I do is work, get in my workshop and, and build boats, you know, and repair boats. Do you ever sail the boats yourself? I've had a few boats of my own, but uh, only motorboats. I've never done no sailing. Mm. 
you steam the ribs, you see. That's the yolk. The, the arm bends around on its own, you see. You cut out the shape, you see, and it, it, it goes around on its own, you see. The arm planking. The boat we've been working on today here, I built 35 years ago, and we're putting seven new ribs in there and two new planks. And then it'll last another 35 years, I hope. There ain't nothing being done to it again. All copper now because they, they're soft, you rip them up, see, and they draw up tight and they don't, they don't leak, you see. And they last. They last for hundreds of years, you see, copper. Because even, even though it's a fairly soft metal, it, it, it won't rot in the sea. It don't rot in the same salt water, you see. They call them the tanks, tanks of the sea. They call them my boats, the big yeah. ones, you see. Last forever and put up with any sea. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Go around the world in one of them. When the weather is right, Tony Hayne gets his son Steve to take his precious pigeons down onto the Chesil Bank at West Bexington and to fly them back to his home at Chickerall. Tony runs a breeding stud for more than a thousand of the sleek, streamlined birds. Here you'll find the Shergars, the Red Rums and the Desert Orchids of the pigeon world and people come from far and wide to admire and to buy. The pigeon is a, an athlete, an out and out athlete, and they're individuals. Basically, what you must do is at the end of the pigeon racing season is not say, well, this is it for the winter, lock the doors. All the work that's got to be done for next year starts in September of the previous year. If there's a nice day during the winter, take them a few miles down the road. It's not basically to keep the body fit, it's to keep the mind active all the time, the home and instinct, keeping that honed. How do you go for a winner? I mean, is it like race or is it good on shape or what? Well, yes, that's true. You do go on shape. The other thing, you go on feather texture. The wing itself, you spread. That there must be very, very tight so that when the wing is flapping, the wind is caught there and not going through. How do, how do you train up for those? Well, the, the copper's reward is seeing his hen when he comes home from a race. As soon as he comes home, you can leave him for 20 minutes or half an hour, if you like. You then take the hen away, and that copper never sees that hen again until he goes into his race pannier. And he knows that. He's learnt that. So as soon as that race pannier is open, shoom, straight over. Our job here and our aim here is to breed future stock birds, to produce the race birds for the general fancy. And you're breeding now in December, a bit early. Which is a bit early, but then our first orders are the second week of February. So the cycle, egg cycle and uh, hatching cycle brings us back to this point in time, middle of December, when we make up. Obviously, this time of the year, I mean, with the stud, it's no problem, we can close up create heat and the right atmosphere for the youngsters not to go back where they hatch. The racing pigeon value goes from 60 pounds up to three, four hundred pounds. And how about a stud bird? Uh, you can buy them in up to 20, 30,000 pounds they cost, which is not unusual. Unlike horse racing, where you know you're, you're relying basically on somebody else training that horse and the jockey doing the job for you. In pigeon racing, you are the breeder, you are the trainer, and all your knowledge going into cre creating that pigeon in the first place, training that pigeon, and then competing that pigeon against thousands and thousands of other pigeons and people. You see that little bird come home after. 500 miles and it's closing its wings, it's racing, it's not just not lopping along, it's racing home to your loft. There's no better thrill. I can tell you that there's no better thrill.
To holiday makers, the sea along the Chesil Beach can seem as meek and mild as a soft summer's day. But this is a place to be treated with respect and with caution. When the wind is unleashed, it can turn into one of the most dangerous places on earth, and even the great wall of stones bows before the strength of the ocean. Perhaps the ever-present threat has, over the centuries, honed and hardened the people who live along the West Dorset coast until they've become as strong, as resilient, and as self-reliant as the Great Bank itself.